Curious Kids is a co-production of WGCU and the Golisano Children's Museum of Naples. Support is provided by the Florida Gulf Coast University College of Education and Edison State College School of Education. I'm Jake. I'm Jaden. I'm Sophie. I'm Leah. And I'm Cody. Welcome to our treehouse. Did you know that some leaders are talking about adding art to the list of STEM subjects? That would make it STEAM. Science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Right. That makes sense to me. Whenever I make my claymation videos, I always have to draw out a storyboard. I love creating. Me too, and lots of times I need math to help me out. It definitely takes creativity to be an inventor. We wanted to learn more, so we looked for examples of STEAM right here in Southwest Florida. Starting off with a visit to meet two great guys who use groundbreaking technology to help people and one very special dolphin. Meeting prosthetist Dr. Kevin Carroll and Mr. Dan Stremka from the Hangar Clinic was really special for Jake and I. They made the tale for Winter the Dolphin. Yes, that winter. The one from my all-time favorite movie, Dolphin Tale. Winter was just a baby when she was found tangled in a crab trap line. She was rescued and brought to the Clearwater Marine Aquarium where she still lives today. Because of her injuries, Winter lost her tail. I heard about Winter on the news that this little baby dolphin had just lost her tail, and I was thinking to myself, you know, we put prosthetics on people, why not a tail on a dolphin? So I picked up the phone and I called my colleague, this. Dan. And I thought, Kevin lost his mind. I thought he <laughs> went crazy. I'm like, this is it. But now, right away, we thought this would be the right thing to do. I mean, grew up in Florida. Ever seen a dolphin, you're not going to fall in love with her. So, this is one of the many tails for Winter. Or, like, do you switch them out or do you make them one at a time? We make lots of yeah. tails. Dan, last time I was down with Dan, I left at about six o'clock in the evening and I was carving on the tail. Exactly how many tails is a lot? I mean, we lost count. Um, she's actually worn about 13 different types of designs, but in those types, we tried many different things in the manufacturing process. We ended up with about way over 50. Wow. We put a new tail on about three weeks ago. And we did that because the last tail she had, she didn't outgrow it. She has mm -hmm. actually started wearing it out. You know, this material would wear out because we have to make it flexible. So, what's that? What's this? <laughs> this is winter's gel right here. And it stretches. Oh. Hold it. Hold it. Hold that side. Hold tight. See how it stretches? Don't let go. See how it stretches? Oh. Wow, don't let it go. Whoa, <laughs> don't let it go. Don't let it go. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Incredible stuff, right? Yeah. So this fits in right with the tail? It sure does. It sure does. Absolutely. It goes in there like that and up over Winter's body. Keeps her Oops. protected. So this would be on her body. We roll it on just like a sock. Do you use the Winter's gel on human prosthetics? Absolutely. And guess what? Before we put it on Winter, we had to test it. We had tested it on a guinea pig. Guess who the guinea pig was? Mr. Dan lost his leg after a lawnmower accident that happened when he was just a little kid. Wearing Winter's gel really helped to make his prosthetic feel more comfortable, so they tried it out on Winter's tail. So how does this leg work? Is it like electronic or...? Yeah, it sure is. And there's actually a computer in here, the hydraulic really? unit, but actually right here is where I plug it in every night. There's oh, a battery so I have to cool. charge it every two days. This is where I plug a laptop in to program it. You know, when we first fit people with them, we, you know, we watch them walk and we're getting a bunch of readings on the computer so we can change things to make them walk better. Was she a stubborn dolphin or was nah. she a... No, she's not at all. Going. She's a great, very easy going. Yeah. If all of our patients was like Winter, yeah. life would be very easy. Yes. Dr. Carol and Mr. Dan had to study a lot of science, math, and engineering to become prosthetic specialists. They've helped a lot of other animals besides Winter, including tiny birds. And of course they fit in many children and grown-ups with artificial limbs. They've even taken some of them to meet Winter. I hope I'll get to visit Winter at the Clearwater Aquarium one day. Research biologist Allison Webb is really into bats. To learn more about these nighttime creatures, Andrew, Morgan, and Mackenzie visited Miss Allison at the Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, where she works as a resource manager. I have so many favorites. Um, my favorite bat in North America, there's two. Um, I really like the pallid bat, which is the species in Western United States that eats scorpions, because they're really cute. They're just they're cute and it's really neat because they can actually hear the footprints as a scorpion scurries across the sand. And then there's this, the greater bulldog bat, which is in Central and South America, and they actually capture and eat fish. Bats that catch fish and hear scorpions walking on sand? Amazing! Like dolphins, bats use echolocation to sense objects, but they're not blind. 
There are over a thousand known species of bats worldwide. They eat all kinds of food, from insects to frogs, fruit, and yes, vampire bats do suck blood, but not from humans. Where would bats like to live out here in the little water area? Um, well, bats could roost in a lot of different places out here. You could have bats roosting in cabbage palms on the periphery of the swamp. Um, you can have bats that roost under pine bark. Seminal bats like to roost in Spanish moss. And cavities in trees like this one are also favorite roosting places. So how can we help protect bats? Being green is going to be one of the best ways to help bats. Not necessarily cutting down like a like cabbage palms, for instance. Palm fronds are home to a certain species of bat. Are any species of bat endangered down here in Florida? The Florida bonneted bat, um, which is the species of bat that I do my thesis research on, um, is endemic to Florida, and it's only found in central and southern Florida. We actually have a bat house here, so if you want to, we can go see it. Yeah. yeah. I loved it out there. These waiting birds were feeding in a gator hole. Yep, there was a gator close by. I got to use my binoculars and see birds like this red-shouldered hawk up close. Way cool. When we got to the bat houses, Miss Allison went to see if she could hear them waking up for their evening flight. Oh, looks like she found something. You know what that is? This is actually bat guano. So this is actually, you know, bat poop. And interestingly enough, each bat has a slightly different poop. So you can actually identify a bat by its guano. We waited and waited, and it got darker and darker. We could hear them chattering, and then, in a blink of an eye, one little bat emerged to fly into the night. Early in the evening as the sun goes down, all the stars begin to light up the sky. Well, there's one little creature that's just waking up till the first crack of dawn she will fly. So many stories I told about her. She's the queen of Halloween. But half the stories are told by people she had never seen. Oh, bats, 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 funky little bats. Bats are the critters of the night. Fun little butterfly and bulldog bats. Bats know where everything's at. You don't go bump me now. The Imaginarium Science Center in Fort Myers is a lot of fun and a real hands-on place to learn. Some of us curious kids went for a visit, and of course, we were very curious about a lot of things. Like the hurricane experience. What would happen in all that wind? Pretty crazy. The wind was so strong, it made our faces feel funny. And what's this? This is Build Your Own Roller Coaster. It demonstrates potential and kinetic energy. You can build your parts all together and see how far you can get the ball to travel. Off we go. Awesome, team. Works with one ball. And with two. Next up, the Idea Lab. Are you guys ready for an engineering challenge? Yeah! yeah. All right, let's go inside. Today our challenge is to engineer a structure that can catch the wind. We have a wind tunnel over here that's going to blow on your structure. Time to choose some materials and put our steam skills to work. All right, so let's make a plan. So it's going to be like a more or less parachute, kind of. So we could use the coffee drop. So what's the plan, guys? Well, we're gonna use like the coffee filter as a more or less parachute. Don't you just love how we all bring our own ideas to a project? New technologies and scientific discoveries thrive on teamwork. Okay, time to try out our creations. Sierra and Riley go first. Jake's going to try our parachute. Uh-oh, not looking good. How about Raphael's? Nope. Okay, maybe Malcolm's will work? Yeah! <laughs> what would you re-engineer for next time? It was too heavy. Okay. So then I, I had it on top of here and I took that part off and made it a little lighter. I put some weight onto here and cut a hole into there. So you gave a lot of thought into weight. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice design. Yeah. The Imaginarium Science Fair was going on, so there was a lot of cool stuff to see outside. Malcolm School's Robotics League was demonstrating some of its amazing robots. This looks interesting. So what is this? It's actually a solar-powered go-kart that we built for high schools that are going to build their own and actually race at FGCU in wow. April. The solar panels capture the sun's energy and transfer it into what's called a smart box. This, in turn, charges the batteries, which then power the motor. 
Mr. Dustin couldn't go very fast here, but the go-karts racing at FGCU got up quite a speed. We got to drive some go-karts too. These ones belong to the Stay Alive, Just Drive organization. They were here to educate us about the dangers of driving while talking or texting on a cell phone. See what happens? Not a good idea. I'm really into robotics. It's a lot of fun to make robots with my friends at school. The main challenge is to program the robot to move and do the things you want it to do. In our group, we use a kind of Lego to make a spider or a crane. Our school's two competition teams recently competed in the National First Lego League. There are over 500 teams from Florida. I think that robots will be a big part of life in the future. Are you curious about robots and what they might do for you one day? Art doesn't always come to mind when thinking about architecture, engineering, and math. But when some of us curious kids visited the Von Liebig Art Center of Naples, we discovered how art is important to them all. We found artist Marty Kohler ready to show us how everything that's constructed begins with the design. What parts of this require math, do you think? The angles. The angles, yes. The square scale. footage. Good job. What else? Scale. The scale, exactly. But it's very important to know how to add and subtract, and also you know about angles to do this sort of thing. Looking at the work of different artists helped spark our imaginations. I really like the buildings designed by Spanish architect Antonio Gatti. What do you notice about this building that's interesting and different from, say, American architecture? It's all rounded. There's no, like, points on any of it. Good. And it's like a mosaic made with plates and glass to make the colors. Very nice. What else? Well, it reminds me of Salvador Dali and his surrealism in his paintings. Time to get creative. Miss Marty had all kinds of materials for us to build our own structures. Since I got there a bit late, Miss Marty filled me in on what we were doing, and I grabbed a blank board and joined the others. Uh-oh, I had a problem. The material I chosen didn't fit onto my board. Well, first we have to measure the platform, and then the fabric, and then we'll subtract the difference and cut it, okay? okay. We measured and marked the material and cut it to fit the platform. Ta-da! Perfect. Aaliyah was building the Naples Pier, but how is she going to keep it upright? Why don't we try like this so that we have some balance with our design because this is a, a pier, a sort of bridge, and even still there's design elements to it that you have to consider. We painted, we glued, contemplated and best of all, had fun creating. Finally, it was time for show and tell. What inspired us? What did we like or not? How do we resolve challenges? My inspiration was Salvatore Dali. I made kind of like a pier scene, and then I started thinking about Life of Pi, so I made a boat. I kind of made mine with a living room theme, with a, a multicolor carpet and the couches. Everyone's creations were so unique. One thing they all had in common was that from concept to design and creation, math, engineering, and physics helped turn our imagination's visions into reality. I love math. I really do. One formula that's really cool is the golden ratio. The golden ratio is any number multiplied by about 1.6. It's fascinating and found everywhere in nature, including seashells, plants, and animals. One fun trick is the way it works in the human body. If I measure the length of my hand from my wrist to my fingertip, it equals 6 inches. 6 times 1.6 equals 9.6 inches, which is exactly how long it is from my wrist to my elbow. Check out where you can find the golden ratio. Have fun! Did you know that seashells were the inspiration for developing super strong materials used in buildings? Or that a new paint formula was inspired by shark skin? It's applied to planes to increase their energy efficiency. Sound incredible? It's called biomimicry, being inspired by or copying the way nature creates things. To learn more, some of us went to meet Dr. Jerry Jackson. It may be a man-made habitat, but this storm water treatment area in East Naples Regional Park was a perfect place to find some examples of biomimicry, starting off with an American coot. It blends in a little bit with the water. It has this really black head, and by having a totally black head, you can't see its eyes. The predator knows it's useless to go after it if it's being watched. If there are no eyes there, then it, it, it's, it keeps looking, trying to find the eyes. Is it watching me or isn't it watching me? 
and it saves this bird from getting eaten. Is the presence of eyes important for other things too? Uh, absolutely. If you ever look at a butterfly and see little eyes on the wings of the butterfly, those aren't really eyes, they just look like eyes. Its real eyes are hidden. They're on the head. And they wouldn't want those to be obvious. But the obvious eyes are the ones on the edges of the wing. And those just serve as a target, a false target for a predator. And they help the butterfly survive. Turns out it's not just butterflies that mimic false eyes to ward off predators. In southern India, in a place called the Sundarbans, there is a reserve for tigers. And lots and lots of tigers live there. And they try to manage the forest so that they can also harvest the timber in there. But the foresters get eaten by the tigers. And it was a very serious problem because a lot of people were getting eaten until they put to use this idea that a predator doesn't like to be watched and won't attack if it's being watched. They gave the foresters Halloween masks and they wear them on the back of their head so that they seem to have eyes in front and eyes in back and the tigers thought they were always being watched and nobody got eaten after that. Biomimicry helps plants and animals survive in lots of different ways. As humans continue to discover the benefits of mimicking nature, there's sure to be more really cool inventions. Spend some time out in nature and maybe you'll get ideas for the next cutting edge innovation. There's some really cool technology out there and it's not just for playing games. It can also get you outside and having fun. There's one app that helps me study for my math test, a lot. I do the practice tests and then when I get to the real tests, I know my stuff. There's also one that's this video app. I get together with my friends and we make videos using the app's super cool effects. Apps can be creative, helpful, and fun. Who knew just a little rectangular thing could do so much? Imagine something really, really tiny, like the size of a grain of sand or the head of a pin. Now, make that a million times smaller. That's what nanotechnology is all about. Alex, Clint, and Jamie went to the Galasano Children's Museum in Naples to learn more. Come on, science educator. Miss Ermilla was going to show us how nanotechnology gives a whole new meaning to the word small. If you divide a meter into a billion parts, you get one nanometer. So when scientists are working with nanoscience, they're working with things that are that tiny. So would you guys like to see an experiment? Look at this speaker. It looks like a white Hershey's Kiss. Okay, yeah. so can I have you, can you pull it out using the stick? Very good. Looks pretty obvious, right? Each beaker has one object. Wrong! The second beaker had two objects. So why couldn't we see that? This one has regular water. This one has something different. Baby oil? Because this one has baby oil, the light travels through it differently. Right? And that's why this one looks pretty invisible. So if you look here, this is an example of how invisibility is used in nanoscience. This is a very, very, very small carpet. And these little indentations bend light backwards. So when you put this over something, it could make whatever is underneath it look invisible. Sound like something from a Harry Potter movie? New research suggests that invisibility cloaks are not so far from becoming a reality. Next up, space elevators. Scientists think in the future we may not use rockets, we may use space elevators. So that's going to be like a long, strong string that takes us out into space. So we'll all, always be connected to the Earth. Time to get creative. So, what did we imagine for our space elevators? So Jamie, do you want to tell me about your picture? Yeah, this is the Earth and this is the Moon because we most often travel to the Moon when we go in space. Everyone had great ideas. Austin's space elevator had a space stairway in case the elevator broke down. Like science and engineering, nanoscience is all about imagination. We all had different ideas for our space elevators. So, how do scientists imagine them? Just like your pictures, it has a very thin cord or cable that travels up into outer space. And we think that the space elevator might be made of carbon nanotubes. Cloaks that make us invisible, elevators that take us into space. Nanotechnology might be about tiny things, but the implications for all of us are humongous. Get up, get out, get active. Do you 
geocaching is a kind of high-tech scavenger hunt. It's really cool. You use GPS satellites in outer space to help you find the treasure. To get us started, Miss Beth gave us some tips. When you go to find a geocache, it's linked to the location somewhere on the Earth that, where that geocache is placed. Do you guys understand what GPS location means? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Do you guys, have you learned a little bit about latitude and longitude or coordinates? There's all these different lines on the globe and they have different names. So the lines that go this way are called lines of latitude. latitude. That's right, kind of like a ladder. These would be the rungs of the ladder going up the globe like that. Latitude and longitude are your global address. They're called coordinates. These numbers are the location's latitude number and its longitude number, sometimes called lat long. We're gonna use satellites in outer space. Cool. cool! What do we need to do this? Well, we get to use these really cool pieces of technology called a GPS receiver. And I have some for each of you today to use. So each one of these has a list of all the geocaches that are, can be found right here in this park and throughout the city of Naples and all across the world. And it's gonna say up the top, come on, let's hike. That's the name of the geocache that we're gonna look for. The receivers also include tips on what wildlife you might see while you're out hunting. Okay, we are ready to go. Oh, we're 108 feet away. <gasps> Mine says 95 feet away. Oh, we're so close. Yeah. Let's keep looking. Come on. Look at these fire ants. Be careful, they bite. Yeah, just like the description said. We were getting closer and closer and closer. I think it's under here. Where? Let's go down and check it out. We found it. Yeah. All right, put it over here so we all can see what's there. Ooh, let's open it up and see what's inside. Yeah. Wow. wow. Cool. Look, look at all these cool things in here. Here's the log book. That's the thing that's in there where everybody who finds it gets to sign it so that you know all the different people that were there. Yeah. And then look at all these treasures. When you find a cache, you can take something out, but you're also supposed to add something back. So we traded out our swag, signed the log book, and then it was time to put it back and go find another one. Mr. Joe Mallon is the teacher who runs Island Coast High's aquaculture program. But as we're about to find out, it's not just about tilapia. This is my superhero electrode. Okay, so what she does right now, she's going around to feed the different animals. Uh, this is our food to feed some of our tilapia, for our bigger fish at least. Just kind of toss them in. Uh, we feed them a high protein diet. And we have really good water quality. That's why you see some of them that are so big. What's up there? Ooh, that is a, this is my, my student's new project. We've never done this before. Do you want to tell them what it is? Uh, these are our freshwater fronds, also known as macabrachium. They started about this big, and they'll grow up to about the size of a subway foot long. Wow. Mr. Joe calls these shrimp condominiums. These prawns stake out their territory and don't let anything else in their space. Wow, plants, prawns, fish. Now, back to fish. See this fish right here? That's called a super male. By super male, I mean they have a double Y chromosome. When they breed, that's guaranteed that the babies are gonna have an XY chromosome, which means they're going to be a male fish. Male tilapia like to eat, and that means they grow big. Time for us to give them some food. They were hungry. Like all living creatures, fish poop, and that makes the water dirty to clean the water without wasting it. Mr. Joe has created a filtration system where that poopy water from the fish tank has purpose. The water now has got to move over here. Okay, if you look in here, I got this hose. It's pumping a lot of air in here. What that's doing is allowing me to grow bacteria. Bacteria? No worries. These are friendly bacteria. They grow on this pasta-like stuff and convert the fish waste into nitrites and then into nitrates. Food for plants. Brilliant. The water then flows into these plant beds. The students are trimming basil plants. The roots filter particles from the water so that when it flows back to the fish tank, it's clean again. Next, it was time to go catch us some fish. Any fish that you see about this big, 
You're gonna throw in the cooler. Any other sizes, we start grading them by sizes. We put them with the different sizes in different buckets. Mr. Joe was getting in the water, so we had to get changed. Before he jumped in, we did a little twist to get warmed up. Then, time to catch up some fish. Not as easy as you might think. There were a lot of fish, but I really didn't want to touch them. So what do you do with all the fish? After we harvest them, we usually donate them to uh, food banks like CCMI, or we'll uh, cook them up at the football games, and so that'll bring in some money for the school. The students belay the fish, season it, and then cook it up. Fish for So what are we making today? Well kids, we're making tilapia stuffed with peppers and cilantro. What do you think about that? That sounds great. All right, well let's get started. Peyton, would you like to put the fish into the pan? We're gonna drizzle it with a little bit of olive oil. And now we get to add the peppers and cilantro. We get to add all the garnishes. So let's Peyton put some peppers on. Beautiful, this gives it a lot of color. Oh yeah. Yeah, do you like peppers? My favorite pepper is the red pepper. Red pepper, what's your favorite pepper? The red pepper too. The red pepper too? Well I like the yellow, the orange, and the green. And you know why peppers are so good? because they're a great source of vitamin C, and they actually have more vitamin C than an orange. They do? Yeah, so it's very nutritious. Let's top it with some cilantro now. Can you put some cilantro on? This is what gives it the great flavor and kick after we bake it. Isn't that colorful? Delicious, ooh, lots of cilantro. Now we're gonna wrap it up and get it ready to bake. What do you think of that cilantro, Peyton? Good. And it tastes good, doesn't it? Yeah. It'll delicious. give our fish a lot of flavor and a lot of zing, and fish is really healthy for us. Okay. Do you know why? Why? Because fish is high in omega-3 fatty acids. It's very low in fat and it's very good for your health. The American Heart Association recommends that we eat fish two times a week for a healthier heart. So let's go ahead and bake our fish. What do you think, gang? Yeah! All right, let's bake the fish. Let's finish our fish. Yeah! Oh, doesn't it look delish? Yum! All right, now we're just gonna top the fish with a little bit of avocado and it'll be ready to eat. You know what, we're actually adding vegetables and fruit and herbs all to this fish which makes it extremely healthy for us and nutritious. Girls, are you ready to eat? Yeah! Mmm, that fish looked good. You sure had fun catching those tilapia, Natalie. I know, it was cool to see how they use green technology to raise food for their school and the community. I had fun doing the geocaching. It's amazing to think of all those satellites out there guiding everyone around. Bats and dolphins are pretty cool. They have echolocation, right Andrew? Yep, and I have a whole new respect for bats now. I liked working with Miss Marty at the Von Liebig, didn't you Clint? Yeah, it was really cool to see how art and design were so connected with math and engineering. I loved meeting Dr. Kevin and Mr. Dan, seeing how their STEAM skills end up helping Winter and so many others. One thing's for sure, it's an exciting time to be learning about science, technology, engineering, art, art and math. STEAM, STEAM rules. rules! See you next time! Watch Why? the birds, how do they?